Welcome back. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has said he will be inaugurating 5G services in India at the India Mobile Con Congress at Pragati Maidan on 1st of October. So 5G rollout is very, very imminent. In fact, at the AGM, even Reliance Geo uh, said that Mukesh Ambani said that Reliance Geo will be rolling out 5G in Diwali. And Bharti Airtel too has said that they will be rolling out towards the end of the year. Now, I just want to make a few points and read out what um, you know Bharti Airtel had to say at the JPM conference, which was taking place earlier this week, uh, earlier last week. So Bharti Airtel said that they would have actually preferred to defer 5G rollouts by a year, given a choice, as India only has 9% of existing phones and 30% phone shipments that support 5G. That said. Party is going to be matching competition when it comes to the rollout timelines. And they said that, moreover, the monetization opportunity will be in the consumer segment from you and me, from your 5G consumers as you upgrade from 4G to 5G, as the enterprise applications are not yet there and it will take time to evolve gradually. So just wanted to give a quick update on what the situation is and what telcos think of 5G even as they gear up for a rollout. All right, so we'll keep an eye on uh, how it develops. For now, let's focus on the market fundamentals and the top sectors and stocks to bet on. Sunil Subramaniam, MD and CEO of Sundaram Mutual Fund, joins in. Hi, Sunil. Thanks for joining us on a difficult day of trade uh, because at one point it looked like our resilience would continue. But of course, uh, nothing continues, uh, you know, in its uh, entirety. So... Uh, how is uh, the market position now? Uh, you know, I know you're still optimistic on the market because, of course, there is a long-term story there. Uh, but in the near to medium term, uh, do we expect uh, increased bouts of volatility? See, uh, volatility is here to stay because this battle between uh, inflation, interest rates, uh, currency is a very unpredictable battle, right? Because the better the short-term news in the U.S. economy, the more the probability of a rate hike and the more they are going to the future growth rates of the U.S. economy, I'm taking the U.S. as a proxy, is going to come down. So are you going to be happy to receive good news from the corporate sector in America or not? It's a million dollar question because you know that if the U.S.'s interest rate hikes are working at the ground, then the slowdown should be reflective now and future rate hikes should be less. So in a very funny kind of a way, uh, the bad news, if it comes earlier, you'll have less more bad news to come. It's a very nuanced thing that I'm saying. So this is now data dependent in the U.S. And you know, the U.S. Fed keeps changing its talk, right? Just a year ago, if you remember, they were talking about this inflation being temporary. Today, they are saying, no, no, this inflation has to be brought down at any cost. So the Fed speak is also talking of the volatility in the market, right? So as they keep coming out with data, as they keep responding to that, for example, the effect of the elections in December, right, for the, the U.S. Senate Congress is obviously playing on the mind there because inflation is not good news during election season. So right now they are talking very much of anti-growth, uh, you no know, pro-inflation bringing down kind of a speak. Who knows, after the election results are over, they may ease up on that, right? Because then they, they will look at a longer term, what's good for the US economy, the battle was of inflation versus growth. The second issue which is uncertain is the news on the war, right? On one day you see Ukraine fighting back, another day Russia's winning. So if the war's prospects are going to continue for some time, then the inflation caused from the war, no amount of interest rate hike, quantitative tightening is going to bring down that, bear in mind that. So that's an unseen battle at the end. And some good news on the war front could change the whole picture. So that's the second piece. The third is from the Indian market's perspective. See, none of this stuff is altering anything about India's growth story. Yes, exports will suffer IT sector, pharma sector, export-oriented sectors will see a slight slowdown if there is a recession, full-blown recession in the advanced countries. No doubt that impact will be there. But apart from that, there's so many other things driving the India story. There is the CapEx, there's the PLI CapEx, there's the government infra CapEx, uh, capacity utilization is up 75% plus. So private sector is gradually starting to build CapEx. So these are all largely domestic-oriented stories which should continue you know, independent of a U.S. recession. So that means that any correction to world growth 
will not apply in proportion to India, right? So take keep that one mind. Second, suppose there's a full-blown recession. What's going to happen? Commodity prices are going to crash. Oil prices are going to crash. And who's the one beneficiary in this whole wide world who is going to benefit from that is going to be India. We import 83% of our oil. You import some significant number of commodities whose prices are related to international prices. So actual recession will mean that you will have less imported inflationary pressures on India. So less pressure on the trade deficit, the fiscal deficit, and less pressure on RBI to hike rates. And also that corporate margins of those companies which suffered when commodity prices went up, you have the auto, the paints, the fertilizer, the number of uh, sectors which use uh, uh, oil-related derivatives in their manufacturing, all of them will get a big breathe, a sigh of relief, their margins will expand and they will get the pricing power then to go and fight in the marketplace with selling product prices if need to boost demand. So you can see that it's the story of an international recession being bad for the equity markets is, is, a, is an advanced country story. It's not only really India. Now, naturally, when there is rate tightening, there is some amount of money which goes back to the US, especially into debt in the US. And that much of money will come out a little bit from each country, whether it be India, or the Brazil, it be any other country. So to the extent our market will experience that volatility, number one. But take it in another way. There's $30 trillion of liquidity floating the world. And how much is India of that? 300 to 400, 500 billion maybe, right? So we are not that big a thing in the place. So if you say there's a risk off strategy, it doesn't mean that 100% of that 30 trillion goes on to risk off mode, no. The proportion changes of how much is risk on related capital flows and risk off. So within the smaller proportion of risk on capital, India stands a decent chance of getting that because that for that risk, there is a reward in the Indian market in terms of easing you know, pressure on corporates for commodity prices, the margins widening, India's growth story is still being sustained from domestic related factors. And third and, third and most important point, is in that period when oil prices spiked, right, 60 to 125, October to June, roughly, right, last October, we saw about two and a half lakh crores of liquidity going out of India, FPI is pulling out. Since July, when these recently stories started, and as you mentioned at the beginning, right, India's good news, what I spelled out was there, and so about $70 billion has come back. There's still 1,80,000 crores which went out of India, Remember, some of that money went from a commodity importer like India to a commodity exporting countries, right? Now, in a declining commodities price story, that reallocation is going to happen. So within risk on capital, I argue that India will get a higher share of the risk on flows that remain, albeit that the risk on flows are going to be lower. So this short-term volatility, I would view it from a medium-term, long-term perspective as a very strong buy on dips with the qualification, don't necessarily go and buy everything which has fallen the most, right? Buy that which is going to be resilient to grow in right. the face of a global recession. So what right? you're saying that is it's short-term pain, but there is a long-term gain and use that as an opportunity. Um, Sunil, I know you don't talk about individual stocks. I'm not going to get there, but I think a lot of our investors want to know that in this volatility, should I be investing in lump sum discretionary spends in mutual fund? I will continue with my SIPs. They will be untouched. But, um, you know, is this the time to be putting that, you know, lump sum? I have one lakh spare money. Should I put it right now? Or do you think markets are going to be heading much lower and therefore this is not the right time to make that discretionary investments into the market? Very quickly because we are out of time. Yeah, no. So if you have a time horizon less than two years for your investment, you stagger your investments. If you have a time horizon, anything, let's say three to five years and beyond, you put that lump sum because the near term volatility at what price you buy is not going to make a significant difference to the longer term return that you make. But if you want to exit in two years and you want to stagger it over the next six months, wait for one more year and then exit, then staggering makes sense. So it depends on the time, time approach that you have in your mind. Okay, so uh, perhaps over the next two years, uh, things could be a bit choppy and therefore it makes sense to stagger your investments. If you put in now, not, not necessarily. It will be choppy over six months. Choppy. If your investment plan is two years, you have staggered your investment over six months and then you wait for a year, you get that equity taxation. And so that staggering would have made a good difference to your returns. 
Okay, so at least for now, the advice is that perhaps you should stagger those, uh, you know, lump sum discretionary investments. Uh, Sunil, out of time, but thank you very much for setting the context globally as well as domestic and what a global recession means for India. Get into a break. On the other side, Indian immigrants in the U.S. who are on a work visa are grappling with long wait times and appointment delays. We'll be joined by...